Reverend Richard, we have known each other for almost five years now. Uh, and the reason why uh, the Baha'i community was attracted to the, to the Unity community is, is, is how, much, how, many, how much similarities we have. You know, the same reason for the Unity movement is uh, being introduced to the Baha'i faith. It was, we have brothers and sisters that are facing the same direction. Right. And so, uh, and what, one of those similarities I remember is, is the idea uh, that Charles uh, Fillmore, uh, the founder of Unity, uh, was, uh, was so much in tune with, uh, with the power of the healing of prayer. It's foundational to everything we're about. The foundation of what you're all about. So, for that reason, I'd like to, to begin with the healing prayer. Please. From the Baha'i writings. Thy name is my healing, O oh my God, and remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope, and love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor in both this world and the world to come. Thou verily, O the all bountiful, the all knowing, the all wise. Baha'u'llah. Okay. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, uh, th this is your five principles. I have studied your five principles, with most of which I agree. And if there are anything uh, that needs to be explained, we will we will discuss it, and you'll explain it to me. I'll do my best through my lens. <laughs> Wonderful. And and also I have attended your class of Introduction to Unity, if you if you probably remember, mm -hmm. and I've attended many of your sermons that I've totally enjoyed. So, uh, and then you probably recall that many times that we went to, you go to lunch or I come and visit you, I often say that our paths are so similar. Uh, we are truly on the same path. And then I've also mentioned that, I don't know when, but at, because you are about unity and Baha'i faith is about oneness, at some point these two paths would merge. Uh, so th this, is, this is what I've felt. I've felt with my total being. So, so with perhaps, that... Perhaps consider the idea that they've never been separated. Yes. They are two branches of the same tree. And of our job is to simply wake up to the truth that they were never separated to begin with. Exactly. And perhaps that same context is true for all spiritual paths. That yes. although they have a unique flavor, a unique perspective, they're still branches, as, as I believe the Baha'i faith believes, of one tree. Right. Yeah, yeah Baha'u'llah says that we are all the fruits and branches of one tree. Uh, we absolutely are. Uh, now, uh, what all faiths, particularly Christianity and Baha'i faith, uh, tell us, to tell us about this vision of oneness, what Jesus says ultimately would be peace on earth as it is in heaven. That, that peace on earth, it seems to me, is when we have all come to the reality that that there's God within. And, and that God within is one God, and therefore we have merged with Him. So there are differences of thought, differences of opinion, diversity of thoughts, which, which is fine. But then diversity at one point would be without animosity, and then that healing would, would bring them together in some way, some fashion. And I think what that requires is first and foremost an open heart on all sides of the equation. Yeah. There must be an open mind, an open heart, and as uh, St. Francis might say, my job is to seek first to understand and then to be understood. To be a receptive environment such that I want to hear you before I have you hear me. And I think in that, if there's a common purpose in that, only good can come from it. Good can come out of it, exactly. Uh, now, um, I'm not sure if you have talked about this aspect that uh, Baha'u'llah teaches that truth, the ultimate truth, is one. Uh, and that uh, he also suggests that through clash of ideas, loving clash of mm -hmm. ideas, the sparkle of truth comes out. So, uh, because I've known you for, for this long time and because I know, I feel your sincerity, and, and I feel that we are on the same path. That's why I said that, you know, uh, I guess both of us came to this yes, conclusion. That, that we will openly discuss whatever we think 
or possible differences. I think that's the ultimate in the building of trust and relationship. Yes. We've had many dialogues where we compared how so similar the two paths are right. that inevitably we come up to the different ways that the two paths express. Right. Uh, it's like a, a multifaceted diamond. We don't say it exactly the same way, yet we're facing the same direction. Right. And I think inevitably if you're in an, an environment and a relationship that is growing, whether it be between two men or two faith traditions, inevitably we're going to uh, come to the place where we have to dialogue about those differences. Right. And I think the key, as you've stated, is in a loving environment. Right. Not in a, in a, an atmosphere of attack or question right. or blaming, but in an atmosphere of helping understand. Helping understand the, the inner truth, the deeper truth, which is again one. Now, Words often get in the way, don't they? What gets Words, in the way? Words often get in the way of the understanding that is yeah. underneath it. Yeah. And unity is very much about what is the intent underneath the word. Right. Words and, uh, and prejudices and superstitions and now uh, I like to think and probably from what I've seen from you as well is that we have we are trying to do away with whatever prejudices and superstitions are. But we have all uh, grown up in different environments and a lot of things subconsciously probably are there without us knowing it. But then this loving conversation would lead us to that further purification, it seems to me. Uh, one would hope and pray. Yes. Uh, I have mentioned this passage from Baha'u'llah in one of his books, but I've brought the books, I'll, I'll mention a few things about the book, the writings of Baha'u'llah and others. Uh, but in, in the first page of one of his books, which is called The Book of Certitude, he says, No man shall attain the shores of the ocean of true understanding, except he be detached, detached from all that is in heaven and on earth. That's an ideal, that's a very difficult ideal. But that ideal that he says in the first page of his book, one of his most important books, which is called the Book of Certitude, is, uh, is that if you really want to search truth, you have to clear everything and then open with fresh mind. That's very much in alignment with what we, we teach here at Unity North. In fact, uh, Sunday's message was about everything that I have known up to the point of where I am today is a wonderful tool that's brought me to this moment. And if I am attached to it, um, I cannot set it down to discover a new reality, to discover a new truth, an evolving spirituality and that's one of the questions that I, I want to discuss uh, today is the, eventually on a growing path the knowledge that I have will leave me wanting um, because the discovery, as Unity puts it, uh, as Charles Fillmore put it, my understanding of God is forever expanding. Exactly. And every day if I am a true spiritual seeker and aspirant, I will be hungry and thirsty for the new revelation of God, the new... Um, understanding of the divine and if I'm only attached to a mythology right. of thousands and thousands and thousands of year ago years ago I'm stopping that forward progress and that's the idea that we have discussed in the past I'm going to discuss it further and I'll try to clarify more from the Baha from Baha'u'llah's perspective the idea of progressive revelations that if you're stuck with the teachings and writings of 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, we can't progress. And Unity would, would say, and this might be a, a, a bit of a difference, if we are stuck with the, the writings of yesterday, not just two or 3,000 years ago, or 10 days ago, or 10 years ago, the progressive revelations are happening every moment of uh, an awake being. Um, and, and my understanding of the Baha'i tradition is that every 1,000 years, a new revelation to build upon the past yes to bring the past into uh, current times is happening. Unity's perspective would be that we don't necessarily need to wait a thousand years for that to happen, that it's happening today, that prophets are, are being born today, sages and great spiritual masters are bringing things to the planet that are necessary for our continued in, in evolving. Now this is, this is probably one of those points that we want to discuss yeah. uh, to see 
if you can come to a common understanding, or at least for both of us to, to explore further. Sure. Uh, now, this idea of progressive revelation, as you beautifully put it, uh, is, is the fact that, uh, yes, religions come, and these, as these religions come, they give us more and more deeper truths uh, from, from generation to generation. Uh, now, I know that in, in reading uh, Unity writings, you think of Jesus as the master teacher. And we also believe him as a master teacher, but we like to think of him or, or know him, not only Jesus, but Moses and Buddha and Muhammad and Baha'u'llah. Uh, the, the common word that we use is manifestation of God. Mm -hmm. They were, they had sort of a direct contact with God uh, who gave us the teachings for that generation and generations to come. Okay, so that's one point uh, that I wanted to make and then get your reaction from it. Uh, and, then, and then the other point is that, uh, is that these teachers are not only good master teachers but, but have a revelation. And that revelation is from that God, and that becomes the other point, whose essence we don't know. We don't know what the essence of God is. And Baha'u'llah explains that we know him through his attributes, which are all the virtues, mm -hmm. which again Unity also emphasizes, that you and I can have those virtues. And then by having those virtues, we, we can become God-like. So I'd like you to elaborate a little bit. Well, let me speak a little bit about that. Uh, uh, the Unity path doesn't say that Jesus is the only way. Um, certainly not. And there is a great deal of... Uh, respect and adoration for every prophet that's ever walked the face of the planet. We have that in, yes. in common, um, as much for uh, Baha'u'llah as Jesus, as a uh, Muhammad, that there is truth brought to the planet. Right. And so we, we look for the common wisdom that is in all of them. Right. Uh, where the, the difference might be is, well, certainly these prophets were more awake. We would say they were more awake yes. and attuned to a higher reality, a yeah. higher and deeper vibration of truth. But they are not necessarily the great exceptions to that. They are leading the way to what is possible for all of us to wake up. They are calling us into a more awake state. Therefore, they are not the unattainable uh, exception to the rule. They are the leaders bringing us into a place where they are an example of what is possible for all of us, what is possible for me to the degree that I am awake. So I would aspire to follow their path, to emulate them to the qualities of being more godlike. Um, and, and Unity would say that uh, it's good to get away from the word God and say love, light, oh, goodness. Com compassion, kindness. These are all words that all, uh, also describe God. Yes. And our job is to emulate them in such a way that we are a little bit more awake. Yes. But, but I think that the difference would be, um, with, with all due respect, is that Baha'u'llah is the great example for unity, not the exception. And that revelations are possible for the two of us, for all of us in the human race. By following the example, we too can have a deeper understanding of God, and they're pointing us in that direction. Uh, yeah, I totally understand. Uh, and I think we need to continue that, that discussion again on the question of uh, progressive revelations. Uh, what Baha'u'llah explains is that uh, as far as the fundamental moral teachings of all religions are concerned, they're fundamentally one and the same uh, on the question of you know, forgiveness and kindness and goodness and uh, the things that you mentioned. These are fundamentally the same from, from Judaism and Christianity. They have been more refined, of course, in Christianity as compared to Judaism. They, they've been refined a lot. Uh, and, and, and so, but, but then, essentially, uh, those teachings are one and the same. Baha'u'llah explains that the difference comes to social teachings. Not, not because, and he would say, God forbid, Jesus didn't know, or Moses didn't know, mm -hmm. or Buddha didn't know, but because humanity was, was not ready for some of those social teachings. So he says, the moral teachings of all faiths are one and the same, essentially. The social teachings change not because God didn't know, but because we were not ready. 
And so on the question of race, on the question of uh, gender, uh, on, and, and on what we call the social teachings, for example, Baha'u'llah suggests uh, one global international language in addition to mother's tongue. So these are what we call the social teachings. Or the question of um, uh, doing away with disparities and economic justice. Of course, there's so much, so much teaching in, the, in, the, in Christianity with regard to taking care, care of the poor, which is the same, but then Baha'u'llah also has a plan, divide, devised a plan for that these extremes of wealth and poverty should go because they would create instability uh, in the world. And, it's not, and, and so on, that, and that, that would be uh, among the social teachings of him. But what I want to mention, though, is that the Baha'i faith, and I think all religions, and I, I want more clarification from you in this sample, all religions consider these prophets or manifestations of God to be totally unique. I mean, all of them to be totally unique. Mm -hmm. In the sense that we can aspire to be like them. And one of the short books of Baha'u'llah, the, uh, the Hidden Words, a lot of it deals with that. That, yes, we are made in the image of God. Uh, in one of them he says, Noble have I created thee, yet thou hast abased thyself. Rise then for that for which thou were created. So a lot of it deals with the fact that, yes, we are all made noble. We are all made in the image of God. But then he also goes on, in putting us in our, in our place, <laughs> in effect, and say that if we can reach that point, we're not God. We are drop, we are drops in that ocean. Yes. He is the ocean, but we are drops. And, we, and our hope is to be in that, that drop in that beautiful ocean, pure ocean. What is your perspective? Well, I think the, the way I would look at that drops in the ocean is something I've used many times. Mm. Um, St. Paul talks about a hand, or a foot, or an eye, or an ear all part of one greater body. The hand is certainly not all that the body is. I would make it to a smaller degree, I am a cell within the body. Yes. That I, I can play my role at such a high level that I am contributing to the greater good of the entire body, but I could never possibly be no. all that the body is, which would be God. Yes. Yes. Which would be the humanity and all creation as the expression of God. Yes. But my job is to play my role as a cell, maybe a little speck within the cell of a finger of the whole. And as I do so, the body will be then transformed. So I'm, as I'm working to live these attributes of kindness and compassion, the, the words that I would use to define the essence of life and God itself, I'm not only changing it for myself, I'm changing it for all of humanity. Yes. So my waking up is not purely selfish but it is for myself, but I am affecting a, a much larger field in which uh, people that I will never meet are being affected energetically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to recognize in the unity movement, it's all about energy. That we are not these bodies, we are not these experience, experiences. It's all a grand illusion that's just made up out of the human mind. And when we return to the place of true source, the energetic level, then, then we transcend all of the difficulties and darknesses of the human condition and we're exchanging energy with people across oceans we're exchanging energy and hum the human race is being changed one drop in the ocean at a time there is a cleansing process happening and um, those that were most awake on the planet Allah, Jesus, other prophets contributed a great deal to that change in the overarching consciousness. Yes. And I want to play my role to follow that example and to know that I'm making a difference yes. and to stay moment to moment, day to day, awake. That we're connected. We are intrinsically connected. Uh, in the whole, we cannot be separate. The cell cannot be separate right. from the body. Why? It can't. The drop of, of water cannot be separate from the ocean. We can think we are and get very full of ourselves thinking, oh, I, I'm, all the, I'm a whole ocean, and that will never be the truth. Right. Uh, so, so in that sense, we see eye to eye then. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. it was also, you know, like cell in a body, drop in the ocean, but we, we're all part of that whole. Yeah. So my question then uh, to the Baha'i community would be, you are a drop uh, of water. Ocean. Is Bahu Allah and the Bab and Abdul Baha, uh, uh, Abdul Abdul Baha, yeah. Baha, 
also drops of ocean, uh, drops of water in the same ocean, no less or more than yours. And, 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 and to, to some extent, that's one of the things that I've been playing with, yeah. is there is it such a beautiful uh, reverence and worshipful um, approach to the prophets of the Baha'i tradition. That, that is a little different. Uh, Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, the founders of Unity, although uh, brilliant examples of what is possible and teachers of what is possible, there isn't perhaps the same adoration for the vessel, the road sign pointing us in the direction. So my question would be, is it blasphemy in the Baha'i tradition, and I, I'm trying to understand, I, I, to put yourself as an equal uh, in the, in the Baha'i tradition as a drop of water in the ocean, perhaps more awake or less awake, but the potential is there to be at that same level. The potential is there, but, but from all I read from the Baha'i writings, and a lot of those things are in this small book, The Hidden Words, is that we are drops in that ocean, but these manifestations, Jesus and Buddha and Baha'u'llah and, and, and others, are manifestation of God, which means if God is the sun and they are mirror, in spite of what some Christian denominations believe that Jesus is Jesus, but he's also God and all that. But Baha'u'llah explains that God is the sun, is like the sun. But then these Jesus, Baha'u'llah, and others, they're perfect mirrors who have been able to get all those rays of sun mm -hmm. and reflect it on humanity. So is it, the unity tradition would say, absolutely, absolutely, the great example of shining the source. Yes. Is that same potential for me to become a mirror to reflect the attributes of God? Does it exist in me, or will I ever be, forever be less than? Unity would say, again, uh, Jesus was reflecting the presence of God. Yes. They say, well, we're often asked, is Jesus the Son of God? And our answer will always be, yes, and so are you, right. and so am I, and so are we. We may have forgotten it, we may not be there, but we do have the potential of being a great mirror, that my life can be such a reflection of the infinite compassion and kindness that I too can eventually get to that level. Now, my understanding of, uh, of all religious traditions, including Christianity and Baha'i faith, from all I've read, uh, is that, again, those are the perfect mirrors, and we, based on our capacity, are still drops or cells mm -hmm. in that ocean. It could be a healthy cell. It could be a healthy uh, drop, but there's still that drop. Uh, so, and in that respect... So would the worship be of the mirror or of the source? The, mor the worship is always of the source. And that would be very much in alignment with what Unity teaches. And, and Baha'u'llah particularly emphasizes, you're not worshiping me. You're all worshiping the one God. And Jesus said the same thing. Yeah, the same thing. I, I've looked in the scriptures to yeah. find where he says, worship me. Yeah, never. He, he doesn't say it. He That's says, follow me. Follow me. Use me as the director, the pointer exactly. to the source. Exactly. So is it, he, is it exactly the same thing? Uh, and that he, he never wants to be worshipped, uh, but, but he's, he's claiming to be that Messiah. Mm -hmm. but, but then, going back again to the idea of progressive revelations and these people being the perfect mirror, and we all have having the capacity to be perfect to the extent that who we are. And, and in that respect, two, two aspects of it. One aspect of it is, is explained here in this, another small book of his. It's called The Seven Valleys. And in The Seven Valleys, he says that in order for us to come to that point of true, our true reality and the real perfection, he says it's a seven-step process. And the last step which we say, I, I made it. And that last step that I made it, he calls it the value of absolute poverty and total nothingness, which means absolute total humility that I have come to realize that I'm really nothing. But then he says, when you come to that point of absolute nothing and total worship of the Creator, then you become everything. Because then you have really merged with Him. So it's, it's a very poetic writing, but that's, that's how he explains it. Uh, the word worth worship uh, sometimes gets it convoluted, and I, as I understand the etymology of the word worship, it's just to simply to acknowledge the value. 
um, and you said merge. That, that's a unity word, that, mm -hmm. that the ultimate goal in the unity movement is to come to the place where you no longer exist as a personality. I am, yes. and we would, unity would call that the silence. Mm -hmm. I have attained the place where, the, as Jesus would say, the Father and I are one. There is no separation. I am living in that energy, um, not defining myself by the drop that I am, but by the part of the ocean that I am. Yeah. And when worship comes into the play, that's a difficult word for a lot of unity people because they've come from very worshipful um, histories yes. where it's worshiping something outside of themselves. It's praising something that is unattainable or unreachable and out here. Unity says everything that we are wanting to bring value to exists already at the point of view and as you wake up there will be no longer a need to worship anything because the value will be so self-evident the, the value will be I'll be vibrating at the place of that value of oneness that I no longer have to even think about God because God's expressing at the point of where I'm at I don't know if that's the the goal of the Baha'i or if it's and you know I always like to, to laugh and say that if I have attained that I probably wouldn't be in physical form anymore Mm -hmm. if, if I'm ever going to get that, I probably have ascended already. Yes, yes. I, don't, I no longer have a need for a body to learn how to relate in this energy. Exactly. Uh, so unity would say our, our, our job is to not maybe attain the place of worship, but the, the, attain, the place of, of complete and total oneness with everything as an expression of God. Yeah, a couple of points. One, on, on the question of uh, reaching that point again, the seven value of absolute nothingness and total humility and having totally understood uh, being worthy of being in the presence of God. So he explains it in that fashion. On the question of worship, uh, Baha'u'llah's explanation is this, that as long as we're human, he says, in man, and I've have shared this with you before, in man, in human, there are two natures. Is a spiritual or higher nature, mm -hmm. and his material or lower nature. We, we don't talk about sin and evil and all that kind of stuff. But he says these two natures is in, is in all of us. And he says in one he approaches God, in the other he lives for the world alone. And what he suggests, and I guess all prophets have suggested, is that we need to seek for that high, higher parts of us, which is God. But then, in order to do that, to reach that, I don't know for how long, maybe, at least for this, Baha'u'llah says each revelation has, has a period of about a thousand years. At least for the next thousand years, he makes it, like all past religions as well, makes, it, makes this prayer and meditation a daily ritual requirement. Uh, that, that worship. Now, of course, ultimately, like the fifth principle that you have in the uh, in, in your fifth principle is the ultimate service, service to the humankind, is the ultimate revelation of it. But in the interim period, he says at least when you wake up and when you go to bed, you need to read some holy writings uh, and, and reflect on them and try to emulate what you have read and studied for the course of the day. And, and with that spirit, you go to bed and then wake up again. So he, he thinks worship to be part of the requirement of the human condition to take us to the higher level. Yeah, Unity talks about the relative realm and the absolute realm. The human existence, yes. which uh, it would basically say is a, a, a grand illusion made up from the mind of man. Um, that it's forever changing. It's alterable. And it is like... A, a fog and a mist that is unreal, completely and totally unreal. And that our job, maybe this, the story of the prodigal son, and in that story it says, and the prodigal son came to himself, coming to the higher reality, the higher truth, our spiritual nature, which then is a remembrance of, I'm not this body, I'm not these experiences, I'm not anything of the earthly realm, I'm of a higher nature. And that the readings, the readings again, yes, do read. Read the words of those who have lived in that place, 
but then put the book down and go into the deep meditation, yeah. the silence, the stillness, the prayer, that I may also live in that place. Yeah. And then out of the prayer, that's, that, that's our fourth principle, is the truth that I uh, know mentally is integrated into my system through quiet meditation and prayer, and then followed up with, now I live from that place. So I enter back into the world, now getting active with my hands, my feet, my mind, and my heart, that I may be a vessel for everything I knew in the quiet and the stillness. Everything of the absolute nature that I knew to be true spiritually, I now work diligently to, so if it's oneness, I know oneness in the spiritual realms. My job is to create oneness on earth and to pay it forward, if you will, to remind others in dialogue and discussion that we belong to each other, we're not, we're not separate. Not separate. Um, and then to live my life as a testimony to that. Otherwise, it's it's a bit of a waste if it stops at me. Right. If, if I know my oneness with God and with, with all creation, and I do nothing to demonstrate right. it, it dies. It's of no use. It's of no use. And in that respect, Baha'u'llah confirms this, and he says that work in the spirit of worship, in the spirit of worship, is worship itself. So in many ways, he says maybe in past generations, for example, uh, in Islam, they they pray five times a day, so they stop working. Uh, and he says, no, if, if you do your work during the day, all day, that's worship. If you do it in the spirit of service. So, again, that's realizing the, the needs of the time. You know, you don't, you can't just go every two, three hours and just now have to go and pray and yeah. uh, you know, wash your hands and do that. He says, do it in the morning, in the evening, and in between work, but then with the spirit of worship. Well, I think that uh, Unity would say, and I believe Baha'i as well, the goal is to integrate it into my life, the, the practice, yes. whether it be five times a day or in the morning or in the evening. These are very, very important practices to integrate a system that life. the worship now becomes a state of being. Right. And it's not so much worship anymore, it's a recognition that when I meet uh, I see something, or behold, or witness something beautiful and sacred, I'm not worshipping God in that event, I have an awareness that God is present right here. There's a, a, a recognition that doesn't need to be reminded in a place of prayer, doesn't have to be reminded in, in doing anything, because my mind and my heart are so centered in God, that when I behold anything happening here, I see the face of God. You see the face of God. Again, in the hidden words, he mentions that several times. Uh, that because we are made in the image of God, and therefore, if, when you when you see your fellow man, see the face of God in that person, and, and in that fashion, you know, revive humanity mm -hmm. to come to the higher level that they deserve to be. So Unity would say, and uh, let me ask this as a, a point of building a bridge here: Is there any place where there is an exception to where that face of God can be found? Is there other than God. Unity's perspective is there is only one power, yeah. one presence, one goodness, and it's everywhere present in everybody at all times, regardless of their behaviors. <clears throat> now, the behaviors will reflect that that person has forgotten that truth, that they're anchored in the relative realm, yeah. in this earthly existence, or they're anchored in a higher place. And Unity does talk about sin as simply a consciousness that believes that they were separate from anything but the presence of God as everything there's a separation is there in the Baha'i tradition an exception to where that God can be found okay. uh, what you said is very much confirmed in the Baha'i writings uh, rather than discussing the question of good and evil in that sense that those people are evil this thing uh, we uh, accept that there's, there are bad things, there are evil things in the world. Uh, but the way Baha'u'llah explains, he particularly likes the words of light and darkness. That there's light, that everybody has the capacity, can have the capacity to seek light, but then he says some people choose to be in darkness. That is not the fault of God, that's not the fault of anybody. They just chose to be that way. But then he says, when you see darkness, don't curse the darkness. Shed some light. Uh, this is what all people of faith are supposed to do. We need to, to shed light. We, we, don't, we don't 
condemn any body, any human being, because they're still made in the image of God. Even that terrorist a few days ago in Florida, or 50 years ago, Hitler, but you know, we talked about that some, some time ago. They're still children of the same God, but they're in darkness. Is darkness the absence of God? Darkness is absence of light, and, and, and darkness is where God is not. God is everywhere, but then God is light. So, again, th this is how a small human being like me can, can visualize it. That, okay, there's darkness, so this means that that light is not shining on it, that God is not shining on it, but then that light can shine on it, but then he's hiding himself. Like a mouse in a you know mm -hmm. in a place. So you, unity, uh, I think, very much in alignment here, would say mm -hmm. the light is there, yeah. but it has been forgotten, or perhaps the eyes are shut. There's no light here. Right. There's no light here, and that the job is to sh shift my perspective such that I open up and realize that light was there all the time. It says in the Older Testament, uh, in the the Jewish scriptures, the Torah, there's talking, I think it was Jacob who woke from a dream and said, surely God was here and I did not know it. Yeah. That if there is an absence of light, evil, unity would say, is is not that there's an energy counter to the good, right. it's just Absolutely. evil is I've forgotten the truth, yes, I'm yes. blinded to the truth, and it's the old hymn, I once was blind, but now I see. Now I see. And that uh, the true awakening of humanity is opening our eyes, yes. opening our hearts to know that God was there all along. And my job, always as a spiritual seeker, is to behold that light right. and to see that. We see, we see, we see it eye to eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, still we are on the question of progressive revelations. Now, so Baha'u'llah says that all these manifestations of God, it just did not happen haphazardly. The reason why Jesus came 2,000 years ago was that there's a higher force up there who directed that source of light, that source of light directed Jesus to be the manifestation of God to shine on humanity. So one thing we say is that it's not haphazard. These progressive revelations come at a place and at a time, one after another, for a reason, to reawaken humankind. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, yet that you mentioned, that we all have capacity to to shine, to be bright within our frame, the drop that we mentioned. Well, I love the idea of the mirror, and I have a story about the mirror. But we all have the capacity, capacity. to be a mirror right. from the source. Right. Uh, so, but then maybe I mean, I, this is the way I understand it, based on Baha'u'llah's writings and the scriptures that yes, God is the source of light. These manifestations of God are the perfect mirrors. But then, because we cannot understand the essence of God, we understand God and His attributes through these perfect mirrors. These perfect mirrors shine on us. Now, I think that if there wasn't Jesus, there wouldn't have been a unity movement. Correct. It be, okay, so, the, so you see, because of that, it's because of Jesus where we have, we have the unity movement. So I think in that respect, then we agree. So he says, progressive revelation is that these perfect mirrors come from God. And then within those perfect mirrors, then there are hundreds and hundreds of pure souls. And those pure souls are just like secondary mirrors. Like, like in different traditions, like Mother Teresa and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and, and Fillmore's. These are the secondary light still within that framework of that major light, mm -hmm. who was Jesus or Buddha. So, it's slightly different. I mean, that's beautifully put, and I think that that's the, pretty much the way the world works. Secondary, third, fourth generation of light bouncing around between us, and that's one of the reasons that we're here, is to reflect yes. the light for each other. The goal of the Unity Movement would be to transcend the mirrors, to, trend, to, to go back to source, to uh, very much one of the things that's difficult for a lot of Unity students in the Catholic Church is if, is if the priest or the Pope is the go-between between the source and uh, ourselves. 
and, and unity pushes against that, that our job is to transcend another being as to finding the light. To thank you for the, the way you have reflected the light, but to go directly to the source. Now, that would also apply to Jesus. That uh, eventually our job is to transcend, and as Jesus said, I didn't do this. This healing that happened, it was the source within me that did this work, not me. Mm -hmm. That our job is to follow that example and to get to the place where the internal world, I am so connected to the source, I no longer need the mirror. That the mirror is no longer necessary. It's a wonderful tool. But the, the job is to get to the higher vibration where I no longer need the mirror. I am living as the mirror itself. So, uh, again, to progressive revelations. If I have to wait, I'm not going to live a thousand years. I, and I, I think that to wait for the next, uh, and then you, you use the reference, God out here has sent the His messengers, the messengers in awaken. Unity, uh, we try, although there is an embedded theology we have to transcend. We would never refer to God here. It would always be God has vibrated at such a level that a messenger, well, then, a messenger has emerged. And that that messenger exists within me, whether I have never heard of Jesus. And then back to your question, the unity movement would not exist without Jesus. I'm not too sure about that. It may be through a different lens. It may be through a different revelation. But I believe that there was a divine idea that needed to be birthed on the planet through the religious science movement, or Ernest Holmes, through Charles Filmer and Myrtle Filmer, the unity movement, that there was a, an evolution of consciousness that needed to be born at that time. And there wasn't a waiting around for a thousand years for that next revelation to come. It is part, Good point. It is part of a, a collective. Every one of them is a cell within the, the, the whole. But if I have to wait a thousand years, I, I believe that you have spoken things to me, to be, not to flatter you. But you have said things from the lens. Uh, you might consider yourself a secondary mirror for me from the Baha'i tradition that have been very meaningful to me and beautiful to me. I believe that you are such a man and such a spirit that if you had never heard about Bahu'u'llah or the Bab, that that light still could have been reflected and that great things could have come from your mouth to my ears, to my soul, that would have been a revelation and a new understanding without the context of the mirror that it's getting closer and closer to the source. I totally understand what you're saying. We are still on the question of progressive revelations. Mm -hmm. Again, I guess we all we agree that these manifestations of God, message of God, have been like perfect mirrors. Perfect mirrors. Perfect mirrors. And then within those perfect mirrors there have been what I like to call secondary mirrors mm -hmm. of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Fitbors and others who have further clarified many of those mysteries and have continued to shine on humanity, on, on large groups. But still, from the Baha'i perspective, and I think that's the, from the perspective of all religions, I, I mean, particularly Jesus has so many passages I don't recall exactly, who says that with, with regard to Jews who were waiting, that you were waiting, and, but, but then they did not see the light in, in Jesus even though that was fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Testament. So in that respect, Baal explained these progressive revelations is not haphazard. There's a timing, there's a place, there's a, there's a sequence, and that within those sequences there, there's the improvement, but then I'd like, I'd like us to come to this point now. And that until the revelation of Baha'u'llah, which was 150 years ago, something like that, because humanity had not reached the range of maturity, therefore this message would come, Buddha or Jesus, would bring this message, would give it to humankind, and then there was a lot of trial and error among humanity. And then because of this trial and error, uh, some people found it in this manner, some people found it in another manner. Uh, the same, they thought it was the same truth, which caused, which even though was not the purpose of Jesus, I've given Jesus as an example, uh, but contributed to a lot of division. Uh, and that's why Baha'u'llah says, 
the effectiveness of each revelation, the true effectiveness, is about a thousand years. And if you look back at Christianity as an example, in particular in Christianity, when I studied the history of Christianity, until the year 1000, we had one Christianity. It was right at that point which was split into the Orthodox and the Catholics. And then at the point of a split, then it seems like the darkness came. The darkness of crusade, the darkness of inquisition. Well, and the danger there, if I were to liken it to our previous metaphor, yeah. is the secondary and third mirrors that said, let me be the voice for Jesus. Yeah. Caused the fracture of the light. The light then yes. fractured because, well, I understand it better than you do. I understand the message of this great uh, prophet and teacher better than you do, so let me reflect his light in a certain way. And somebody over there is reflecting it differently. Unity would say, bypass all those secondary mirrors and go right to the original mirror and have the experience that is your experience. Go directly to God and, and maybe, and I don't know how it is in Baha'i, it's probably less fractured. Um, that's the the next message point is, is, is less fractured, but if I wait a thousand years, could it be, uh, with all due respect, yes. that the Baha'i tradition could also get fractured, your perspective, somebody else's perspective? Is there disagreement about how to interpret the beautiful holy words, the, a secondary mirror, and really, I, I think that this is a place of agreement as well, go to the words and interpret them for yourself, rather than through somebody else's lens. Okay. I may have taken you on a bunny trail there. The, the, this, is, this is right on the path of progressive revelations. So these prophets come, these messages come, they are perfect mirrors. They guide humanity, particularly in the first thousand years, but not because there was anything wrong with the message of Jesus or mm -hmm. Moses or Buddha, but because of the human ego and because of the newer needs of humanity. For example, the Luther movement. From what I said from the Luther movement, uh, the, the, the Catholic Church had become too rigid, and and they had uh, they had done a lot of bad things, uh, in, including uh, trying the, even for the science not to advance through putting Galileo in, in jail. You know, yes, putting him to death. Uh, putting wanting to put him to death and things of that nature. So, not letting Christians to read the Bible. All the things, right? The go-between. It's it's the go-between. The Pope right. is the authority. You He's don't, the authority. Don't read it. Don't oh read no, it. you don't read. I think behind. Read it, please. Read it. Read it. <laughs> and 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 bypass the secondary mirrors. So, Baba says, for whatever reason, uh, the uh, the uh, then these religions split into hundreds of sects. You know, there's 72, 73 sects in Islam, hundreds of sects in Christianity, and then the fought fiercely for generations, and Shias and Sunnis are still fighting in the Middle East. Uh, and, and so, he says that's one of the reasons, that humanity, no matter how good the intention may be, cannot put those factions back together. It's only the renewal of religion through that main source of light, which is God, who brings the other manifestation to bring us to that source of unity. So. What Baha'u'llah suggests in this respect is that, for one thing, as you, you know very well, and you practice it very well as well, is that he says that in this day and age we don't need preachers. You know, for example, I'm a, I'm a nobody Baha'i. You know, I don't belong to any even the institutions. I'm just a Baha'i. Well, and the fact that I'm speaking for the unity movement is counter to everything I believe. I'm, I'm speaking for myself. Yes, right? I know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so then, so then in, in that respect, uh, Baha'u'llah says that in this day and age, uh, you don't need a preacher to tell you what's right, what's wrong. Go to the depth of your heart again, as you said, mm -hmm. and read it for yourself and find the truth. So that's one thing. But then he says that no source other than, other than the source itself can put it back together. No. That's the huge claim of Baha'u'llah. That's why he wants you to read all of the stuff that I brought to you here today. And say that whether he was the Messiah, or he was, or he was an imposter, or he was not the Messiah, whether he had a plan toward the goal of Jesus, peace on earth as it is in heaven, can the different denominations reach that? And he claims that the plan that he has 
would take us to that to that point. We have started on that path, and that path is the path that began in 1893, the passive interfaith. So that through this interfaith that particularly you and I can see, I've been visiting a number of churches the past couple of weeks, I told you, uh, that we see the light in all of us, and we see the unity in all of us, but does we there, work on that path. Does there come a stopping point in the interfaith exploration? This is a question I ask myself. We can coexist together with the common moral teachings, with the common uh, expressions that we all agree upon, but as we dig into the deeper aspects of the theology, we inevitably come up against, well, I'm right and you're wrong, in many of the world's traditions. So we don't play there, but it's still there. Is the job um, to eventually transcend all dogma, to transcend all writings, to transcend all holy scriptures, to then be the vibrating center of what the scriptures contain within them, those divine ideas, and we let go of that which is divisive. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, we can spend time with our uh, Muslim friends, but they will not acknowledge that the Baha'i faith has value. By the, they'll, they can certainly appreciate you as a a wonderful human being and a wonderful gathering of people, but by doctrine, eventually we come up against the wall. It is invalid. That Baha'u'llah is invalid. It's impossible. In the Christian world, eventually, if we spend time with my Christian brothers and sisters, they will come to the place in our exploration that says that unity is also invalid. It is a distortion of Jesus' truth because it doesn't agree with mine. Is there and this is only a question, because I wrestle with this, eventually we need to transcend all the words, the beautiful Holy Bible, all the words of Charles Fillmore, all the words of Baha'u'llah, that we then are radiating as brothers, not even as brothers, but as one. Where there is no Iraj and Richard, there is just the presence of life. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it is an extremely worthy goal and perhaps it will be darker before it is brighter because we have to confront our mythology we have to confront our scriptures where they served as a revelation that was necessary at a given point but are now outdated that are now at the place where we have to transcend them because our understanding of God has now expanded our understanding of oneness and unity has expanded beyond something that was written a thousand years ago um, and that's that is a, a universal questioning of my, the own writings that, that inform my spiritual path today. Will I get to the point, or does humanity get to the point where it no longer is necessary, and, and in fact it is a hindrance to, maybe beyond interfaith, it's just the state of oneness. Well, and that's just a conjecture that sure. maybe in 10,000 years, in 20,000 years, uh, what you're you're saying may may come may come. Could it be tomorrow? Uh, but uh, but my understanding that it cannot be tomorrow. It cannot yeah. be a thousand years from now. Uh, when I read Paula's writings, I see the connection. Uh, I I would have I I I internalized a much higher value for what I knew from Moses and Jesus and Buddha, because he shows us in one of his books called The Book of Certitude. Is that the one? Yeah, The Book of Certitude. In, in this book, which is The book, book of Certitude, one of these books, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably the, the lower one here. Yeah. yeah. In The Book of Certitude, he shows us that connection. That for one thing, these religions were connected. They all came from that source. That source authorized us to when the next one should come. I don't know until then. Until, maybe until there's peace on earth that is in heaven. And that piece of earth, uh, as is on heaven, movements such as unity and others can help. But from my understanding, it won't take us there. Now, I want to make two points here. One, can, can, I, can we pause for one moment? Please. Uh, just to ask a question. Um, so the, the Islamic world does not recognize the, the prophecy of uh, the Baha'i faith. Well, my understanding is that then that the Baha'i faith 
would not recognize the prophecy of Charles Fillmore, which came later, not much later, no, the time is not right. You have to return to Baha'u'llah because Charles Fillmore is a secondary light and you need to go to, to the Baha'i faith for the real light, even though we're saying the same thing. And I, I would say that the revelation of Charles Fillmore is equally as valid as that of uh, the Baal. Um, and that the revelation of Wayne Dyer is equally as valid as Charles Fillmore. That these are all steps, and perhaps there are plateaus. Every thousand years there's a plateau, the next prophet and sage, but there are steps to get to that point that are necessary steps, um, that are being uh, gospels, if you will, that are being revealed today, that are getting us to that next place where we, the, whole, the whole humanity is raised to the new vibration and then the new teacher shows up. Well, you are in fact answering that question in many ways. Yes, these are, these are the steps to take us to another plateau, for the next manifestation to come, something to that effect, yes. Uh, also, I want to mention in one of these books, Abdu'l Baha uh, mentions in one of in in one of his books that uh, that there are many who may not have even heard of the word Baha'i. Many, many, millions. <laughs> but he says this is the spirit of the age. I, I guess we we had that discussion sometime. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this is spirit. That if if you don't rise and, and spread this message, others will do it. And these others, for example, unity, unity movement. For example, you have, you are the ones who invited Baha'is and encouraged them Correct. to come and do this. He well, said because I, I I realized that there's such a beautiful message in the Baha'i faith that is not being heard, and the same is true of unity. Right. It, we're we're the best kept secret. Why are we a secret? Why are we afraid? to espouse something that is so relevant to the evolving of humanity and that has been such a gift. And so that's why I asked the question, why are, why are Baha'is so silent? And it was not to critique. Right. It was because I want the answer to why are people in unity so silent. Right, right. So, so in, in that respect, I guess it's sort of answer to the question and then what you mentioned yourself, is that uh, these movements help us toward that ultimate unity and oneness of the humankind and and real unity and peace on earth. It helps. But then, what Baha'u'llah is, is asking humanity, particularly enlightened people like Richard Berglund, is that please read and reflect on some of those solutions that he has. For example, among these solutions is that yes, things happened and mankind was not mature and we had to have ministers and these ministers, some of them, divided mankind into this sect and that sect and that sect mm -hmm. and sort of their own and split further and further and further, further. But then he says that at this time, uh, Baha'u'llah, through the force of God, is putting a stop to it. Well, you mentioned that would that split also into the... And the way he has put a stop to it is that he says that, for one thing, he said, as long as I'm living, of course, Jesus was crucified. He was crucified by being in jail for 40 years and yeah. exiled and jail and, <coughs> and tortured and all of that. Crucifixions come in many forms. In many forms. And he kept writing and smuggling it out of the, out of jail. And then encouraged anybody who became his followers to ask questions. Ask questions. Because all these questions are important for pos posterity. And it became thousands of questions and answers. As to, among them, how is it possible not to split? Because all these religions split. And though his solution is that he has, he has a book which is called the Book of Covenant. That you have a covenant with God. You are now mature human beings. You study it. And also he said that I'm going to, based on, the, on what he was told by God, that for this age we will create a democratic system which is different from all democracies. A democratic system is what we call the local, local spiritual assemblies, national spiritual assemblies, and then what we call universal house of justice. Which I, in my humble opinion, would liken to a great spiritual democracy. It is a spiritual democracy. Right, and getting us away from hierarchical right. Uh, spirituality. Right, and then you said that none of these individuals, as you probably know, even on universal, there are nine people from across the globe. Right who are elected as members of universal justice. But they said, together, 
you, you can act and together you can decide. Mm -hmm. But then individually you're just like any other Baha'i. You, you, you don't have, you're not even one step higher than them. See, and I think that's the ultimate goal. And I, 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 I joke that my job is to work myself out of a job as, as a minister. Right. You know, to eventually have such a congregation that everybody is, is the mirror for themselves and that everything is collaborative. The cells are all working together. The, the small goal. body Maybe it's cells within the hand, they're all working together, and the hand then is cooperating right. with, with a, a unity church in a whole different country right. as, as part of a larger body. I, I believe that's the ultimate goal within the Baha'i tradition, within the unity tradition, and hopefully within the interfaith exploration, yes. is that we realize we're using different words, we're having different ways of expressing it, we're expressing the same thing. Um, I have hope that that's possible. In our world today, sometimes you can get very tired, very tired. because as much as you uh, wave that f banner in the air, there are people waving more loudly against it. Yes. So again, on the, on the question of progressive revelation, and the question of coming together, and the question of the possibility, not only possibility, but because inevitability of oneness of the humankind, for example, in this small group of five, six million Baha'is, mm -hmm. that's the way they do it. So, and then this universal justice, he tells them in his covenant, and he, he has a book called the Book of Covenant, which says that's the way you will do it. And that he says that anything that I have codified would be the rule. So in a way, you can call Baha'is, I mean, I don't like to, to use the word fundamentalist, but it is fundamentalist in that sense. He says that I gave you all of these things, I answered all of your questions, and then my son, that I, I would tell him to be, because he has lived, lived all his life with me, and he has read all of my writings, he would explain everything to you until he dies, which he, he died in, in 1921. Uh, and, then, and then he says, at the point when universal justice is formed, anything which is not codified, anything that you still have questions, and there were still lots of questions, that's why this last book came about, yeah. the, the, the book of questions. You can still ask that source, and that source, either unanimously or majority vote, should give you the answer. But then when they give you the answer, that is the answer. You cannot come up with your own answers, mm -hmm. because that would be hundreds of so sections. So let, let me ask you a question, because I've heard the term many times in my associations with my friends from the Baha'i tradition, the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece of God, yeah. that Bahu Allah um, and the Bab, these were the mouthpieces, right? Yes. Uh, God speaks to humanity through them. Now, as I understand what you've just said, is the mouthpiece becomes a collaboration. Yeah. That, but, they, that there is interpretation of these beautiful writings through nine people? Nine people. Nine people, do they then become the mouthpiece of God? That's a wonderful question, and he has an answer for that too. Basically, uh, you know, the, we, we call them the central figures of the Baha'i Faith. The Bab, who was the forerunner mm -hmm. of the Baha'i Faith, Baha'u'llah, who, uh, who was the founder of the Baha'i Faith, and Abdu'l Baha, who was his son. Uh, he's, uh, and and he, uh, he, he, he passed away in 1921. So this period, which was 1844 to 1921, is, is when we say uh, that God was in contact with these guys to codify and write everything that humanity needs for the coming few centuries. And then in his covenant, what he put together as, uh, as, uh, as, as the covenant with this universal justice, he says, now I have given you all the laws, which means he has given us the prayers, the fasting, uh, the, the, in terms of the, the rights of men and women, and the question of races, nations, everything, everything that you can think of, is it altogether? It's about hundred books in hundred volumes. But he says, if there's anything whatsoever that is not in here, uh, then universal justice can do it. But then he cannot change whatever he has revealed. So they're not allowed to interpret; they're allowed to elucidate, elucidate, yeah. elucidate, which means they clarify whatever is here if somebody doesn't understand it. So is there the danger, as what's happened with Christianity, to clarify, your, I'm still clarifying through my lens, or is the universal house of justice such 
that they are so connected to the God that they are not clarifying from the human ego or from their own interpretation and, and perhaps that's a beautiful thing that each Baha'i interprets the holy writings the same way. Uh, so if we've got nine people they have to come to an agreement yes. about what it is but there are millions of people that consider that they're all looking through their own lens interpreting it their own way. Is that a danger? That very much like Jesus' words Unity likes to go back to the original Aramaic because it is not from the Greek. It has been translated by thousands of peoples and rulers and kings and politicians that have twisted it. Right. How, what, is, uh, what does the Baha'i tradition do to ward against uh, my own interpretation? Right. So, so because of all of this and more, uh, all the interpretations we think, and I, and I go through this, you know, they have thought of the most minute things mm -hmm. in different things are here. But they're still, we are human beings from all across the globe, from Africa and Asia yes. and Europe. They come up with a new question that nobody had thought about. But Bahá'u'lláh says that they would be divinely inspired. I mean, because there's no interpretation. He says, when I say that, when I say that in this dispensation, there's marriage is between one man and one woman, and that's it. So, you know, South Justice cannot come and say that no, but, but he really meant two, two women or, or something like that. He cannot change those rules. But then, if there's anything which was not clear, they can clarify it. But he says, in that respect, they're divinely inspired. But they are they're not allowed to interpret, they're allowed to elucidate. Like, and that's another step toward unity. Okay. So, words I would use to understand this is there is a spirit of the law and there is a letter of the law and for the current time and period it's not changing the writings but it is it is elucidating shining a light upon the spirit of the writing as opposed to the letter of the writing for instance, uh, for instance. one of the reasons this dialogue came about is a wonderful gathering we had where it got a little bit tense um, Yes. And I, I, I look at that as a beautiful thing, not as a negative thing. You and I didn't, but others did. I, I, some others did. Others looked at it differently. Well, exactly. Some I some, think uh, if we just pretend that there are not philosophical differences or different lenses we're looking through, we just pretend they're not there, we never really get to the true right. sense of oneness. That we have to, I, I often like to say that it, the road to the oneness is going to go through the portal of un uncomfortableness. Yes. And if we don't get uncomfortable, we're just whitewashing and, and sugarcoating our philosophies, that we have to be getting uncomfortable. And one of the things that came up was the idea of the gay lifestyle. Yes. And unity is very accepting. Of, we attract a lot of gay people because they're being accepted for the first time. And my understanding of the original writings and laws of the Baha'i tradition, that, that it, it's, you can be a Baha'i, but you cannot practice a gay lifestyle. That is not accepted. You'll, you'll be loved, which I, I so appreciate. You behold the magnificence of that human being, but they cannot practice. But there are writings that have come from the council in order to elucidate the letter of the law as opposed to the spirit. The spirit of the law, through an ignorant lens, through a unity person's lens, would say they don't accept gay people. Right. And my experience in that dialogue, I tried to soften the blow a little bit is is that you accept all people and you I, you have demonstrated that every Baha'i I have met accepts all people and is loving and peaceful and joyous and and there's a sense of oneness so how I wasn't quite sure how to deal with it that night yes um, because it was obviously very uncomfortable for a number of unity people and for a number of Baha'i people yes. And there was a panel of Baha'is, and I wasn't right. in, the, in that panel. I, I, I didn't want to interrupt them. So, go so how does the council then, yes. because we can't change the writings, right. that, that would be uh, we can't do a it. disservice. You cannot yeah. do it. It would be a disservice to the beauty and the poetry and the truth contained there within. How does the council then interpret those words when a unity person comes and says, well, Baha'is don't accept gays, so we are not really one. We're not teaching the same thing. Right. Okay, so now we are coming to the point of these uh, discussing these uh, perceived differences, mm -hmm. which I guess you and I think and know uh, that no, there's no difference. There's one God, 
There's one religion. Well, in your, but there's one God. <laughs> and, and it's... And God everyone. within. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one God and there's God within. Uh, and there's really one relation, the honest truth. And much more than we can even conceive. Conceive, and much more. And then we are limited, still we are limited human beings with our understanding. So, and particularly on that issue, um, I think some, some of our friends have not totally studied that question. Uh, yes, we go to the original Baha'u'llah's writings, and he says that, uh, that um, homosexual, homosexual relations, basically, is not accepted. Uh, now, Universal justice cannot change that ruling. Right. Now, that is different from different sects in Islam or different sects in Christianity because they make up their own stuff and then they would say that this is our understanding of Christianity. The way I understand it. Uh, but because Baha'u'llah has, Baha has limited them in effect. This is, this is how I would have responded to that question that night and we can discuss it some more. For one thing, all religions of the world that I know uh, do not accept homosexual relations. All religions, which are Old Testament, New Testament, Quran, uh, Baha'i writings, do, them, do not accept homosexual relations. Yeah, and Unity would say that Jesus never talks about it. Jesus, our, our master teacher, never even mentions it. He doesn't. Paul does. So, it's an interpretation. interpretation. Paul is a secondary mirror. That Jesus is teaching through this his lens and this is how you yeah you mean. okay then you know as justice starts with this beautiful beginning that we are essentially a spirit we are all part of God in the world of the spirit there's no male or female or gay or lesbian and this that we are all it's very much in alignment with unity so that's the first thing. second he says that all religions including by faith do not accept uh, uh, do not accept sexual relationship between unmarried people then then the third one said that marriage is for the sake of procreation and because it is for the sake of procreation it is between a man and woman mm -hmm. then they explain that all human beings gay lesbian whoever whoever they are are welcome to the Baha'i faith but if they accept the Baha'i faith, uh, they, they cannot be a Baha'i and also have, have a sexual relationship, whether they are gay or lesbian or, or man or woman, mm -hmm. except if they're married. So this is how it is explained. But then in, the, in that sense, I'd like to say that this is in line with all religions. I don't think... Uh, well, not think, necessarily unity or, or religious science, you know. The, more contemporary religions that have emerged have have, emerged, yes. have transcended uh, teachings and one of the things I love so much appreciate about the Baha'i faith uh, so appreciate it is the understanding of, of science the partnership with science yeah. and science evolves yes and as I look at religion it doesn't necessarily evo evolve right. at the same pace as science religion does not it, there were once uh, believed that it was of the devil. Uh, there were writings that believed that uh, homosexuality was of the devil. And then it became more of a moral teaching, and it's just, it's for procreation, and I get that. Science is saying people are born the way they were born. Uh, and, and again, I, this is not a, a critique, it's, it's trying to understand and build a bridge, because what I see only in the Baha'i people and the Baha'i community is love. Love for the individual. Regardless of the behavior, there is still love and an, and an awareness. Um, the idea of a progressive, and maybe in a thousand years, there'll be a progressive revelation. I thought of it exactly. That there is a change in the human consciousness yeah. that says, uh, a new revelation says that homosexual people can be Baha'is. Yeah. Can well, be, can they, be, can, they can be Baha'is. Can be Christians. Can be, can be Muslims. I don't know. Maybe we need to again transcend all of the ancient teachings to build upon the good of those teachings, but eventually go to the place where science says there's nothing. It's not an abomination to be a homosexual. It is absolutely just one other aspect of our humanity. And I don't know the answer. I do know that unity. You know, our people will have a difficult time 
um, and unfortunately uh, take that very small teaching, that very small yes. portion of the teaching and want to go after it. As what, and that happened to a degree in our, in our gathering. And I say, look at the overarching, there are so many bridges. Mm -hmm. And if there are stopping points, let's not belabor the stopping points, but let's, let's explore yeah. the, the bridges. Well, I don't want anything to be the stopping point, actually. I want, I want them to, I mean, to, to keep discussing it until we come to the point of comfort in understanding. Uh, so, and that brings us to the question of yes, harmony of science and religion, which is one of the tenets, twelve principles of the Baha'i faith. Uh, but the question, the, the question that I raise in that in that point is that probably you and I know that there have been many sex changes, right? Mm -hmm. That that many homosexuals have been able to transcend the situation, yes. become a man or become a woman. So, my understanding, and it's my understanding of the. Uh, Baha'i Council who makes these decisions is that this is a still uh, an evolving part of science. It is not a definite point. And perhaps when that definite point comes, it is the point of the next revelation, as you said. He said that, you know, yeah, these people are born homosexual. That's the way they are. They can't change. And they should be given the right to, to marry as well. So, which is, all of it is accepted. Baha'is welcome homosexuals. They accept homosexuals. But then they say that they don't go to anybody's bedroom, including man and woman, and say that you're not married, why did you have sex? They never do that. That has come up too in terms of the question and all that. Mm. We're not going to pry on your lifestyle and all that. This is what Baha'u'llah said. This is what we are all trying to do, whether we are a man or a woman or homosexual. And by the way, I just heard, I saw it on Facebook that Baha'i homosexuals are having a conference in one of the cities, Ohio, I think, someplace, hmm. uh, that they're having a, a conference to discuss these issues. I, w I would love to be a fly on the wall in that dialogue. Yeah. Um, and again, is there, just asking the question, is there a possible fracturing of the Baha'i tradition? Because there are those within Baha'i that don't feel that that is right. Yet there's a whole group of people meeting to discuss, uh, and I'm a heterosexual man, so it, it, it's not personal to me, but there's a group of yeah. heterosexuals, homosexuals meeting to discuss Baha'i tradition and Baha'i teachings. And then how to but it's not, a, we don't have a thousand years yet. Right. It, could there be a new revelation happening in that dialogue? These brilliant, beautiful people having a, sitting down and talking about the uncomfortable questions, could something emerge? Uh, and I don't know if that's possible with the construct of the Baha'i tradition. I, I, one of the things I love about Charles Fillmore is he said, I reserve the right to change my mind. Now, he would be viewed as a secondary mirror. Yes. But the, the understanding of God, of the infinite, of religion, of oneness, is forever expanding. Right. You know, certainly there are people in the unity movement that would never even consider having uh, inviting the entire Baha'i community into our sanctuary right, right. at one point in history. Yet, I believe that there's an evolving in the unity movement to say, why would we not do that? Why would we not invite the Imam to come share? And we've done that. Yes. And some of the concepts that the Imam shared from the Muslim tradition were very foreign to us, yet we need to put our ears on and to listen. So there's, unity itself is always evolving. Always and evolving. I, I think that all religions to be valid in the current time, evolve with science, evolve with the, the culture of the day, and to meet the needs of today. And I, know, I don't see that as a stopping point at all. I see it as an, a wonderful opportunity. Yes, it's an opportunity. To say, uh, perhaps we have, the filter of our minds has interpreted scriptures one way, and, and it can be interpreted without changing a word. I, I don't mm -hmm. know the answer because I don't know these either, words, that's a good these words are, are do great respect for the spiritual truth contained within. And again, we don't, I don't but want no new religion, including unity, to be bastardized as Christianity has been bastardized, pardon my French in that, by it becoming so fragmented that we don't even know what was really taught in the beginning. The great Some question, people say that if Jesus himself came back to earth, he could not recognize his faith. What did you do? So split. <laughs> <laughs> and and Baha'u'llah says that's the reason why he came. Yes. He didn't come to repeal Christianity. 
he, he, he came to renew it. Yes. In that sense. Of that. And that's what he says that, uh, he, he says that, well, I, I forgot the passage, so I'll stop. Well, maybe this what is I, the, What I think is the most common thing, uh, to maybe put a bow on our dialogue, because this has been, I think, very beautiful. We may not have all the answers. You and I sitting here are not going to have all the answers. Exactly. We never will. Um, we are just two men with certain ideas trying to build a bridge. But to not try to build a bridge because we have uncomfortable moments, or right. to not try to build a bridge because there are subtle differences or things that we don't understand, is giving up. Yes. And I, I, I believe that you, uh, I consider you to be uh, such a great friend, such a great Baha'i, such a, a beautiful spiritual seeker of all traditions. To stop that would be a disservice to the Baha'i tradition. And for me, as a unity aspirant and, and seeker, to stop exploring when it gets uncomfortable, or to stop having dialogues when it gets difficult, is a disservice to Charles Fillmore, it's a disservice to Jesus, it's a disservice to uh, the Bab and Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. We need to confront these things. Yes, we need to confront not, and confront is not the right word. We need to be willing to sit together and put our ears on. And try and again, to as, as you mentioned, uh, you know, there are many things that I don't have the answer, you don't have the answer. No, you're we are seekers. We are seekers. And, and, and on that question of homosexuality, for example, uh, this is a situation, and in, and in some ways, the hands of universal justice is tied by whatever is here in all of these books. But then they elucidate the best they can uh, under the circumstances until the next manifestation comes from, from our perspective. Yeah, and I think the only difference would be is that unity says we don't have to wait a thousand years. Yes, I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, and it doesn't, it, it, it's a man-made construct, a thousand years, ten minutes. These are all man-made constructs, and our belief is that within God, within the infinite, there is no time. That is all, we all we a beautiful sense evolve, of oneness, yes. and we like to use numbers as simply as long as it takes for humanity to evolve. Yes. So whether it be a thousand years, or ten years, or ten minutes, it just represents as long as it takes for the transformation to happen. I'm sorry. And maybe the next prophet will not be a person, but the next prophet, or the second coming of Jesus, will be a new age that the, uh, the human consciousness will be raised and suddenly we'll all have an awakening at one time. I don't know. I would love to be here when it happens, but I probably won't. Um, but I'm going to diligently stand for that time coming as brothers and sisters yeah. facing the same direction. Yes. And you probably know that Baha'u'llah claims to be the second coming of Jesus. No, I did not know that. Okay. Well, you know, all religions await the Messiah. Uh, Hindus await the reincarnation of, of Krishna, and Buddhists the coming of the fifth Buddha, mm -hmm. and, and Jews coming of Lord of the Host, and uh, Zoroastrians the coming of Shah Bahram, they all have a name for it, and Christians the coming of Jesus in the glory of the Father, and, uh, and Muslims, interestingly enough, are, come, are waiting for the two messiahs, like we call it the Baba and Baha'u'llah, which they call it the Mahdi, and also the return of Jesus and the glory of the Father. So, uh, and Baha'u'llah claims in the Book of Certitude to be that Messiah, uh, and that he did not go through this 40 years of suffering and 20,000 people who gave their lives for this faith for nothing. It well, and people still today doing that. And they're still doing that, in, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, and there, there was a purpose. There's a reason, and that reason is nothing but peace on earth as it is in heaven. And the passage that I wanted to mention, conclude perhaps this segment of our discussion, is this that I've said many times, that Baha'u'llah says this, I mean, all of this. This is the changeless faith of God. It's the same religion. This is the changeless faith of God. Eternal in the past, eternal in the future. And then he says, you deny one, you deny them all. And that's what I mentioned the Baha'i Center, that when I come to your center and see that all these posters from different religions, and then putting that sign up 
one God, many paths. I see that you and I are on the same path. And we are seekers for truth and we'll continue to seek truth together. I will join you in the journey. You, you did touch something, and I hate to prolong our, our dialogue. Uh, unity is not waiting around for a Messiah. Unity says you are the Messiah that you seek. You are the light that you seek. The being saved from the human condition it already exists at the point of view to the degree you're awake. But uh, let us continue to wake up together. Let us continue to hold hands, to join voices and hearts, minds and spirits, to know that there is something good happening. And we may not know exactly what it is, but we'll keep taking one step after another in the direction of that greater good. Exactly. Uh, now, uh, you did mention the question of these different, this question of the differences among Baha'is also come up, mm -hmm. and then uh, the possibility of splitting and all that, uh, that uh, going the wrong way so that we accept 90% of these things, but at that point we don't accept, so we are this Baha'is of this type or that type. Uh, this is human nature. Uh, from the beginning of the Baha'i faith, actually from the time that Baha'u'llah was still here living, being in jail, teaching his, his faith, but they were trying to split. They said, mm. even, even during his time, and then there were more after he passed away. A lot of them, including his own family, they, they were closer, and they thought, you know, well, if Baha'u'llah is the prophet, I, I, I also have this opinion, mm. so I would do this. So uh, the point that I want to raise is that, not that this people have not tried, but Baha'u'llah, through his authority we believe from God, has said that whoever goes on that route in this dispensation will be, is self-destructive and will destroy himself. So what is interesting is that perhaps, I don't know, 2025, there have been 2025 movements of groups who because of this or because of that have tried to create their own sect within the Baha'i faith. Mm. Uh, but basically there are 10, 20, 50 people who do this and they sort of fade away. And there's still people floating around. But Baha'u'llah said they, they call them covenant breaker. He says, because this is the covenant, that's what I have proposed for unity of mankind, but then if Baha'is want to have their own sect, it won't happen this time. If it makes any sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Hmm. There's okay. a, overarching laws, there are overarching rules yes. that prohibit that. Yes. And, and it assures, you would say, energetically, a house divided against itself will fall, that those who are splitting off trying to, to be separate will eventually fail. Okay. It cannot, because it's a house built on sand, as Jesus right. would say. It's not built upon rock. Right. Because if you talk about oneness of mankind, and you have certain rules and all that, and I said, I have my own rules, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, the bottom line, the rock is the oneness of all humanity. Okay. You cannot deter from that central Foundation. tenet. Right. So thank you for being thank my partner. Thank you very much. <laughs> my friendship with you is one of the best parts of my life. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Thank you.